Facebook AI builds crazy walking robots, Baidu builds automatic excavators, and Eleuther AI turns one. Welcome to ML News. Hello and welcome to ML News, your moderately regular update of what's going on in the machine learning world. Let's dive in. The Facebook AI blog writes, AI now enables robots to adapt rapidly to changing real world conditions. These are robots that you might be used to from things like Boston Dynamics. However, Facebook trained those robots purely in simulation and also end to end. While most people who make robots like this, they rely on sort of predefined policies and then some controller that classifies what policy must be active at any given point, these robots are trained end to end, meaning that the input signal is directly converted into the force values on the actuators that should be applied. So the cool thing here is that this robot can adapt really rapidly to changing conditions in, in its environment, which means that it can handle a number of different terrains. So here you can see the robot going off path into grass. And here you can see that it quickly adapts to its leg being blocked by a rock. Now, the interesting thing is that this robot was never trained in the real world. This is a pure simulation trained robot. To achieve this and to quickly adapt to different environments, Facebook AI trained two policies. One is a reinforcement learned policy, essentially the base layer of just moving around in different types of worlds with different parameters and so on in simulation. By now we have a pretty good idea of what it takes, of how we need to set up the simulations such that things work moderately well in the real world. However, to bridge the gap to actually go into the world and deal with problems, there is a second policy that sort of adapts to changes in the environments. So the robot constantly predicts from what it has done so far, what it expects the next sensor readings to be. And if those sensor readings turn out to be different from what it expects, it knows that the environment has changed or is somehow different than what it's used to. And it can rapidly adapt to that. And that's how the robot can deal with such different environments. So safe to say these robots are getting to the sort of level of where they can actually do really good things. And the potential applications of them are nearly endless. There's a paper going along with this uh, called Rapid Motor Adaptation for a Legged Robot. Sis? Robot? Sis? that details this two strategy approach to making the robot really adaptive. And it's by researchers of UC Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon, and as I said, Facebook AI research. Check out the paper and the blog post if you're interested. Baidu research comes up with an autonomous excavator system for material loading tasks. So in this article, they detail the development and research on an automatic excavator system. Now, this is a pretty cool thing. Apparently, excavator operators are in short supply around the world. And also, the job can be dangerous sometimes. Machines give us an advantage here in that they can operate 24-7 and we can send them into maybe dangerous, maybe toxic environments. So with all of this being pretty cool, there is a video to go along with this. And something's very strange in that video. Listen up. Baidu Research Robotics and Auto Driving Lab and UMD have developed an autonomous excavator system, AES. The result was published in Science Robotics. This is an AI generated voice. No? Like, <laughs> how meta is this that the video on the fully autonomous excavator system is AI generated. Like, listen up, like, I, I might be super, but this is Baidu AI generated. Research Robotics and Auto Driving Lab and UMD have developed an autonomous excavator system, AES. The result was published in Science Robotics. The construction industry has been booming, fueled by demand for new infrastructure and digital transformation. <laughs> this is a, this is a robot voice. Nice, nice. Uh, if this is supposed to be like an an Easter egg by Baidu researchers, well done. 
All right, next news, Eleuther AI turns one year old. In this blog post written by Connor Lee, one of the co-founders of Eleuther AI, he details sort of the coming about of the whole organization. Of course, starting with the effort to replicate GPT-3 in the open. The blog post details how they went about it, how they organized, when the various members joined, how the initial successes looked like. It's a Pretty funny article, and it details more than just GPT-3 replication, such things as the Pile dataset, which is now publicly available, and the various successors to GPT-Neo, be that GPT-Neo X or GPT-J, and also the recent uh, pushes into biology research and ML art, mostly using models such as Clip. Apparently, this is also the origin of the Unreal Engine trick by JBuster, which I reported on previously, but good to see where it actually came from. The article finishes with a bunch of reflections by the individual members and also an outlook on the near and maybe far future. And of course, a bunch of memes. I totally encourage you to check out the article. It's a pretty fun and entertaining read. Okay, next news, The Verge writes, Elon Musk just now realizing that self-driving cars are a hard problem. This after Elon Musk tweeted out that the full self-driving beta is shipping soon and that generalized self-driving is a hard problem as it requires solving a large part of real world AI. Didn't expect it to be so hard, but the difficulty is obvious in retrospect. Nothing has more degrees of freedom than reality. Of course, Elon Musk uh, is known to sort of overpromise things and then under deliver or deliver too late, but he's also known to actually deliver on stuff. And I've done an analysis on Andre Karpati's talk on the fully self-driving system that Tesla is building up. And honestly, it looks pretty cool. So for some reason right now, it's fashionable to dunk on Elon Musk, which is exactly what this article does and what the whole article is about. And of course, there's all kinds of reasons to dunk on Elon Musk, but for some reason, it seems to be the hip thing to do, much more than to dunk on various other personalities. And this is not lost in the comments. Uh, people notice that the coverage here is a bit less favorable than coverages of similar things, for example, by Uber. But beside all of this, I've noticed something interesting in that the slug, the URL of the article, which you do usually for search engine optimization, uh, you kind of want to condense the title of the article into the URL such that the search engines pick up on it. It is Tesla Elon Musk full self-driving admission autopilot crash. There's no crash in the title. There's no crash in the subtitle. In fact, the word crash appears uh, only about after half of the article talking about various crashes Tesla had. But you know, I just found this to be funny that it was in the URL. Make of that whatever you want. Next news, MIT Technology Review writes, we tested AI interview tools, here's what we found. And the subtitle is, one gave our candidate a high score for English proficiency when she spoke only in German. So the experiment is pretty funny in that the candidate is supposed to undergo some sort of an English competency test. And when she did it regularly, she received an 8.5 out of nine. And then she did it a second time and just read the German Wikipedia entry for psychometrics. And the system awarded her a six out of nine for English competency. Now, of course, the funny thing is that the machine gives a relatively high score uh, for not even speaking the correct language. Safe to say the message one should get from this experiment is we have a long way to go when it comes to deploying these systems. Really, there should be checks to see whether the candidate actually speaks English about the topic they're asked to and so on and so on. What this is not really is an effective criticism of the model model itself. The article even says she completed the interview again and received the same score. So at least the system is moderately reliable, giving the same output when you give the same input. We all can see that these systems aren't perfect yet. 
And there are other studies that show that the background you have during an interview, whether you wear glasses or not, and so on, can all skew these automatic systems uh, to one direction or another. And there are also big questions with respect to where the data is sampled from that goes into these systems. And of course, you wouldn't dare to use the horrible, horrible, horrible biased L2, L1, whatever loss. All the losses are problematic, apparently. So the article tested multiple systems and all the systems gave essentially a response whenever the interviewee was doing German instead of English trick. Now again, is this a problem with the model itself? Probably not because the model was mostly trained to distinguish better English or more standard English, whatever you want to do out of that from less standard or less desired English, whatever that means. The model was not designed to distinguish not English at all. And I think that the thing to take away from this is that if you deploy these systems in the real world, especially if they work on human inputs, if they deal with humans, if they have some decision power or some input into decision power, it is important to think of the outliers, the edge cases, the out of distributions, things that could come into the model that you didn't necessarily intended. And to build in some safety measures to have some sanity checks here and there. And in the future, I hope we're able to find a way to take the best of what these AI systems have to offer and infuse just a little bit of the human process back into them. All right, next news, Runway ML releases SQL, which is a video editor, which is one in the browser, which is already pretty cool, but two, has a lot of built in AI tools. So right now the main feature is the automated green screen, but they also advertise automatic depth maps, automatic optical flow and other things. So it's not entirely there yet on the level of a sophisticated video editing software, but do give it a try if you're interested. You can try it out for free and get an impression of what's possible right now. I did it and the auto green screening is pretty nice. Next news, the MineRL Basalt Challenge is now a official NeurIPS 2021 competition. The interesting thing in this challenge is there is no reward function, but your system is judged by humans. So the way it works is that you get a textual description of what you need to do. For example, make a waterfall or build a village house and you just let your agent run. And then at the end, a human gets two runs from two different agents agents that have tried to perform this task, the human has to rate which one did it better. There is no other reward function inherent. You may design one yourself as a developer in training the system, but ultimately you're only evaluated on those human judgments. Since uh, human judgments are expensive, there is sort of a bit of a, a marketplace system in place with respect to evaluating those things. So in order for your agent to be evaluated on the platform, you first have to go and evaluate a bunch of other agents. How exactly this is going to turn out is not clear yet. I can imagine the research community being good spirits and actually evaluating the agents rather than just really fast click on a random scoring. But we'll see. I hope the best for the challenge. And if you're interested, participate. So there's an article by Francesco Rabona who recently got tenure and having gotten tenure apparently now feels uh, okay to speak out about some of the problems that plague the review system. This one is the myth of the expert reviewer. It is a pretty entertaining article and it makes the point that if we go more and more into the direction of expert evaluation, this is not necessarily a good thing. His main point is that the more expert you are, the narrower your domain of expertise and therefore anything falling outside of that domain you either don't care about, you think it's bad because it's not in your domain, you think it's bad because it's not done by you, or you just don't know anything about it because it's outside of your area of expertise. This delivers a little bit of pushback that expert reviewers are a good way to solve the reviewing problem in machine learning. The reviewing problem being that because of the explosion of the field, we have not enough reviewers and therefore more and more non expert, more and more uh, inexperienced uh, at the beginning of their careers, researchers come 
come and review for the big conferences and generally that signal is very noisy. The author here identifies that with expert reviewers you get a whole different set of problems which aren't necessarily an improvement to the old system. The article outlines one particular story where the author fought really hard to get a paper past other reviewers simply because the other reviewers dismissed it and that was in a system featuring expert reviewers. He says, in reality in my 15 years of experience I rarely saw the reviewing system working as it should. Most of the time in order to get a meaningful decision on a paper you have to work hard, so hard that people might end up deciding that it is not worth it. I myself have less and less strength and patience to fight many of these battles. I did not gain anything in any of them, probably only more enemies. So I fully agree with this article and with the problems it outlines. Lines. So I invite you to read this article if you want a more in-depth and an actual example of how something like this played out. A bit of a silver lining that I see is that the community seems to be moving away from this system of expert reviewers. It would be really sad if we decided that in addition to the broken review system we would need to introduce some new on top review system featuring expert reviewers from domains like ethics or something like this. I mean imagine that that. So NVIDIA writes, NVIDIA launches the UK's most powerful supercomputer for research in AI and healthcare. Now the comma here makes me fairly confident that this is in fact the most powerful supercomputer in the UK and it's applied to research in AI and healthcare and it's not just the UK's most powerful supercomputer for research in AI and healthcare. Whichever way you want to interpret this, this is a big big machine. So apparently Nvidia invested about a hundred million US dollars and the computer is for AI research as it seems mainly in industry research such as medical research and other things. This the system is called Cambridge One and features 80 DGX A100 systems, each of which contains 8 uh, A100 GPUs. Of course this is all connected with super fast, infinity, whatever, and I'm excited to see what people will make of this beast. Now, it's always cool to see the photo galleries of these things. Um, I have to say it looks pretty slick, but I can't, I can't uh, help to notice that there is a little a hole in the back there. So this is where your box would go, I guess. Okay, Charlie Snell writes an article uh, called Alien Dreams, an emerging art scene, documenting the rise of artists that make use of OpenAI's clip model, of which they released at least a small version, I guess, into the public. So of course, clip is one of the parts of DALI. DALI is the system that can take text and turn it into images. Now, OpenAI has not released DALI, but just a version of clip. However, people have figured out that while it's not not so easy as with DALI, you can in fact use CLIP, which is just sort of a classifier, a judgment, a similarity metrics for images and text. You can use it to generate images. In fact, the images it generates look a lot more trippy than classic images you get out of DALI. And there is an emerging scene that this article documents uh, of what people get out of these models. And it also details a little bit of the history of how this came about. First using things like Big Gan, which is also something that I used in my music video, if you haven't seen that yet. Be my weasel, be my check it out. But then going beyond that, and especially the incorporation of things like VQGAN have made big differences in this model. And lastly, also tricks like the Unreal Engine trick. So if you look at these things now, they are really stunning pieces of art sometimes. And they're now not only images. So little videos are made out of them or they're being combined with 3D photo in painting such that you get a 3D experience of the world that these models create. I highly invite you to check out this article and uh, try the link notebooks for yourself. MIT News writes, Infrared cameras and artificial intelligence provide insight into boiling. 
So this article is actually about a very serious problem if you want to cool something using cooling liquid because the cooling liquid needs to touch the surface that it is actually cooling in order to transport the heat away from it. And there is a thing called a boiling crisis where the liquid starts to boil in between and if that happens to a certain degree then the liquid is essentially lifted off of the surface which means that the cooling effect isn't as strong and Anymore. So too much heat in these systems can actually lead into a feedback loop of even more heat. And that's what they refer to as boiling in this case. However, if you just read this as if it were about like boiling an egg or <laughs> boiling your spaghetti, it's a much funnier article. Infrared cameras and artificial intelligence provide insight into boiling. Yes, yeah, I always wondered how boiling works. I always thought it's just making stuff warm, but we definitely need AI to investigate. It says things like, in previous research, his team spent almost five years developing a technique in which machine learning could streamline relevant image processing. Good job. And other gems such as, machine learning is not biased by our preconceived hypotheses about boiling. I'm not so sure about that. Have you ever thought that boiling might be a social construct? What is the data you use for the boiling? Who made the data? What color were the eggs that boiled? It also says to collect data, they boiled water. To collect data, they boiled water. That's what I would do too. And also, this is a big deal. I agree. Boiling has such complicated physics. It's been almost impossible despite at least 50 years of extensive research on this topic, boiling, to develop a predictive model. Yeah, it's not as easy as if you make stuff warm, it boils. And as an outlook, they say the idea is really to push the button and come back to the lab once the experiment has finished. Okay, I think I've milked that joke about as far as it can go. Next news. <laughs> So Forbes writes, language lessons from an artificial intelligence. So apparently there are companies now that make use of image generation in order to assist language learners, which means that instead of just having some voice talk to you in the language you want to learn, you do get an avatar with it, an AI generated avatar that can be of any sort that you want, speak any dialect that you want, look any way you want, I guess. They say rendering text into talk is easy. Our one's trick is to pair that text reading capability with a friendly human face. Now, while I'm totally convinced that a what feels like a personal interaction might benefit you in learning a language rather than just some voice processor. Look at the eye contact. Yeah, that's kind of creepy. <laughs> Well, if you if you like things like this, if this is for you, you know, good for you, you've just gotten an upgrade to your language learning skills, but you can definitely see the future where there's still noticeable artifacts in the generation of these faces are just not enough such that you notice and where the whole appearance and mannerisms are just a bit more human. Honestly, I think what most of these artificial avatar AI assistant systems get wrong is that they always try to model sort of a perfect human, a absolutely polite and forever assistive thing, which we all know doesn't exist. So it might be a bit harder to get the exact calibration right, but all of this might feel a lot more real if the humans were just kind of stinky sometimes and have their own opinion and aren't always and 100% friendly and polite. Maybe a startup idea, who knows? And with that, that was it from this week's ML News, and I wish you a pleasant rest of the week. Bye bye.